Good morning. I guess it's afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here on this bright and sunny morning, uh, bright and sunny afternoon, um, for our uh, conversation and presentation on right-sizing our school district. Um, part, of, part of what I wanted to express this morning is, first of all, is thank you for uh, those of you who are joining live stream. Uh, we're glad to have you as well. Um, we're going to be talking, several of us are going to be talking this afternoon and uh, sharing with you um, in a very transparent way the whys behind how we got to where we are today. So I wanted to first begin by talking a little bit about the guiding principles that we utilize to uh, make our decisions, uh, at least initially, um, when looking at the educational experience for all of our students. And if you draw your attention to the, uh, the screen, you'll see that there are some key words that are highlighted um, on, on the screen behind me. And those are highlighted for a distinct purpose. As we worked with our community uh, and our administration and our staff to identify some of the principles that would help to guide our decision, decisions moving forward. These are the, the key points that, that came out. Uh, first and foremost, uh, safe, healthy, uh, health, safety, and welfare of students, faculty, staff, and uh, the community. That we were working to ensure effective and efficient programming uh, throughout our, our school system. To be, uh, to be really careful that we looked at cost efficiency uh, in the operation of our system and with our staff. And to utilize data um, and the capacity uh, data that we collected on two different occasions that uh, dealt with our, our future enrollment. Equal access was another uh, key point in guiding our decisions. Uh, in addition, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had opportunities for our community to invest their time and their input um, to make sure that we were meeting the values that are expressed uh, specifically by our community as a whole. Um, equitable opportunity, we wanted to make sure that all of our children that uh, came to our schools had the same opportunity um, to experience success regardless of which schools they went to within our, our district. Um, something that you've heard uh, much about over the course of the last, uh, I would say, five years um, is the, the concept of, of making sure we pay attention to the whole child and create an environment that's nurturing. Um, Whole child education is, is a focus, um, and there's uh, probably an hour's worth of presentation we can do on, on the tenets of what makes um, successful whole child education. Um, the ability for us to work collectively and collaboratively in a transparent environment um, to solve critical problems, uh, to cr creatively think about solutions, and to make sure that uh, we communicate uh, effectively with our, our district uh, stakeholders. We want to make sure that uh, when students come to our schools, um, that we have a futuristic mentality, that we're, we're striving to uh, make sure that the spaces that we educate um, and teach in are developmentally appropriate um, and uh, are created in a way that maximize uh, learning. We wanted to make sure that as a principal we have instructional strategies at the forefront of what our students experience, whether they decide to be uh, future college students, uh, go uh, through the career tracks, um, but ultimately we want to make sure um, we start in, in kindergarten and even earlier um, to make sure that our students, by the time they experience um, what Wilson has to, to offer, um, that they are life ready. Uh, probably one, uh, one is just as important as, as the other two. Um, and to make sure that 
that there are multiple paths for students to come in and out of those uh, college and or career paths so that, um, that we are paying attention to the needs of uh, the individual child. We, w we wanted to focus on um, everything that we do on a child's readiness um, to advance through our curriculum and, and have multiple uh, opportunities for students that may need additional intervention or assistance as well as those that maybe are ready to, to uh, strive uh, and um, work in an environment uh, that is uh, much more um, advanced. Again, the word whole child comes, comes up um, because we truly believe that uh, as a, a vision for our district that it's not just the academic preparation that we're responsible for, it's everything that encompasses a child's experiences, where, where, whether it be um, uh, mental health, whether it be um, you know, learning to work together, whether it mean um, being in an environment that is uh, supportive so that the child can blossom into the uh, citizens that we hope they will be. And, and then um, focusing on health and wellness, not only of our, our students, but also of our staff, because we know that um, the education system, just like parenting, can be uh, uh, very stressful at times for all of our kids. So we wanna make sure that uh, that, that we um, are cognizant to the fact that uh, children develop at different stages, um, that we need to make sure that, uh, that their heart is, um, is touched um, before we reach their mind. Um, we all know that uh, the better that we are at uh, meeting the needs of our children as they come to us, the better experiences that our students will have. Um, in the Wilson School District. I want to I want to say this as well. Uh, we we know and we under, understand that we're not perfect, but um, we are doing our absolute best to keep these guiding principles at the forefront of everything that we do, and and really trying to hold each other accountable to the fact that uh, these are extremely important to us uh, as educators and as a community. So the purpose of today's meeting is to, to begin the conversation and, and to, to be extremely transparent about some of the challenges that we're dealing with um, as we continue to grow. Um, growth is a good thing, um, but growth uh, requires that we take a look at uh, the data and we make sure that um, we don't um, wait too long to address some of the needs that we know are coming. So. Uh, seated at the table with me, and uh, if I forgot to introduce myself, I'm Richard Fadley. I'm the superintendent, the proud superintendent of the Wilson School District, and with me um, to my left, your right, are Dr. Chris Trickett and Dr. Stacy Stout uh, is to my right uh, and your left, and they're going to be a part of uh, sharing some of the information that uh, we've put together as a collective team to make sure we, we set the stage for the future conversation that will be happening. Now, this is just the beginning of this. Um, there will be other opportunities um, as we go through uh, formulating a plan to make sure that we are engaging our community in a very transparent way because um, it is important that, that we keep you informed as to where we're at. So with that said, I will transition to Dr. Trickett, who is gonna, gonna pull up the district map, uh, which you should see behind me at this point in time. And he's gonna, going to speak to some of the, the, the specifics as to what we found in our school system in helping to drive our decisions moving forward. So thank you again for being here. Thank you, Dr. Feedley. Um, so over the course of the last two, two and a half years, the district and our team has really been analyzing uh, enrollment trends, analyzing how are families um, moving into and out of our school district, how are new homes and apartments being constructed, how have different neighborhoods that make up our, our community 
changed over time. Um, and, and with that has, has, has brought with it the opportunity to partner with someone that has helped us kind of study the, the, these changes um, really since that time. And since the end of the 2019 school year, 2018-19 school year, compared to where we stand today, this district has grown by roughly 300 students. That's as of right now, I just pulled the data from today. So the district is growing, which is a, which is a great um, thing to know about our community. It means that people want to live here. They want to raise their families in this school district that all of us are part of uh, creating and, and making as, as great as it is. So we're proud to be here today to kind of talk through some of the challenges that that brings to us as a team. Uh, what you see behind me is, is our school district. The large black lines that, that kind of outline the different shapes represent the, the boundaries for our five elementary school buildings. And it's really hard to see um, from this slide deck, but if you have access to this on the website, which you will, you'll actually see the school buildings. They're placed down exactly where they're located um, within each region. They're little tiny school buildings with flags on the top. So that represents the five elementary schools. And you can see the little pink dots. The pink dots actually represent families. They're us, they're me, they're you, they're Dr. Fadley. All of us that have children in our school district, we're represented by a dot. So I have three kids uh, that all go to the Wilson School District. There's one dot on this map to represent my three children. If I drill into the map, it's all um, dynamic. I can drill in to see exactly what makes my kids unique. I can drill into my neighborhood and I can actually break apart my neighborhood and analyze the types of families that, that live in that neighborhood. Maybe is there, are they single parents? Are they first generation um, students in our school district? We have access to all the census data that comes in as well and it all kind of populates into the system. So it's a very powerful tool that we use as, as one of our um, uh, tools to kind of make recommendations to our school board. The items that are outlined in blue are currently um, there are sites within our district that are either currently being constructed or there are, they're in the process. What we believe and the people that we're working with, working with the local municipalities, that they will be under construction soon if they're not already. And looking at this map, I'm sure you can attest to, to driving by some of these places and seeing the houses going up. Uh, most recently and closest to here, uh, we have a couple major sites. You know, we're looking at Village Greens Golf Course. Most of you probably know where that is behind Paparones. That is slated to be a, a community, um, an apartment community for people in our district. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, Iroquois over there um, across from Southern Middle School, if you would continue on Iroquois, go through the traffic light, it takes you into a, a parcel um, that actually they just laid the construction um, stones in to allow for the, the heavy equipment to go in. Again, that's a site that will be constructed um, with, with townhouses and apartments. Those of you that live are over closer to uh, Schweitzer Road um, near Pendergast probably have driven back there and have seen that there's 36 townhouses that are up as well as um, at least 30 single family homes um, totality and that, that phase on the right hand side will have 99 properties. And there's a variety of other properties. One of these is an over 55, uh, which will not impact the school district, so we're analyzing that. Um, and then there's also some additional growth that's going to happen around the Green Valley and West Campus. So all of these properties are properties we're watching. Uh, we're analyzing to see how those properties will impact our school district and using this information to help inform the recommendations that we bring to you today and ultimately bring to our school board um, later on this school year. Dr. Stout. So what does this all look like when we talk about growth across the district, um, particularly in the area of attendance and enrollment at elementary schools? So this next slide is actually a snapshot, a recent snapshot from our one data collection system called Ed Insight. We can go in there on a daily basis and see the fluctuation of enrollment numbers. So by elementary school, you can see kindergarten through fifth grade, most of our current elementary schools were built for three sections and then were expanded to four sections of each grade level. Uh, currently, we have five sections of some classes in most of our school buildings. And so um, you can see those numbers um, in totality. We also um, are keeping track very closely of our class size numbers when it comes to individual classes. 
So our target numbers, just for your reference, and that could be a different uh, conversation for a different day, but um, our reference numbers were 20 in first grade and kindergarten, 22 in second and third grade, and then 24 in fourth and fifth grade. Now we've gone plus or minus uh, one or two students in each of the classes, but the target has been to still keep those class sizes at a manageable level. So when they get beyond uh, where we can service students and they're getting too large in enrollment numbers, we've opened new sections. So that's why you'll see five sections in some school buildings at some grade levels. But you can see some of those numbers um, are quite large. You can see Green Valley Elementary School creeping um, classes over 100, and of course, Whitfield Elementary well over 100. And um, if you do the math and divide by five, you can tell what kinds of class sizes we're talking about. And I think, Dr. Trickett, you're able to share the same type of information for, for middle school. Sure. Before I move on, I'd just like to uh, kind of go through the totals because I, I see in the right-hand column uh, it's not totaled up. As of today, uh, Cornwall Terrace Elementary School has 525 learners. Uh, Green Valley has 578. Um, Shiloh Hills has 531. Spring Ridge has 552. And Whitfield Elementary School, right down uh, below the campus that we're at today, has 621. Mm -hmm. The functional capacity of our elementary schools is 540. That's derived by taking the total capacity and multiplying it times 90%. That allows us to create efficiencies in our scheduling and our programs that we have academically in our schools. Um, so three of those five schools right, are, are over, um, some significantly over what's considered the functional capacity. And we've dealt with that in a variety of different ways. We have some short-term solutions in place, uh, but our conversation here is, is long-term solutions. <clears throat> so, this doesn't just affect elementary schools. If we're going to be looking at a potential shift in, in how we educate and where we educate elementary learners, obviously it will affect our middle school learners as well. Uh, we are in a pretty good position right now with balance between our two middle level buildings. You can see that information. I tried to pull it out in white uh, to make it a little bit larger and easier to see. Uh, we are seeing growth in those, those environments as well. So part of our, our plan and our recommendation is really to, to target in a secondary space what we're going to do with Southern Middle School. West Middle School is, is a beautiful campus. Uh, it's, it's built within the last 12 years. There is ample space there, um, lots of natural light, beautiful labs, beautiful exper um, you know, um, physical plant for, for children and our staff. But Southern is, is, it needs, it needs a little bit of work, so we're going to talk through that. Um, but we also just need to consider how we adjust these elementary school kiddos and their families and how that will ultimately impact Southern and West Middle School. You can't just move students from one building to another and not consider the impact at the middle level and not consider how that will affect siblings. So it's, it's a complicated and, and complex conversation. And so what we're proposing as a solution for now um, that is a little bit more long-term than something like portable classrooms um, at multiple buildings um, is to do what we're terming a right-sizing. And that means to create a balance among our elementary schools that exist that will prepare us for a longer-term solution to where we can get to a space if um, our board deems that construction is necessary of another school building or whatever other solutions uh, longer term, uh, that, that's a few years out. So we have to propose a solution that will be something that's effective over that interim period. And so um, in thinking about what Dr. Trickett said, um, we took a snapshot, and again, you can see these numbers that are the current student count don't match exactly what, what he read to you from today. Because as you know, um, we do have some transiency and some fluctuation in our enrollment um, day to day, but there are just a few students here or there. Uh, there are three schools in our current student count that are exceeding that 90% capacity. In fact, our Whitfield school building is over 100% capacity when you look at our current student count. And that's even um, with the four students less that he mentioned today, since today uh, Whitfield is uh, 621 instead of 625. <laughs> Thank you, Principal Joyner, as of last night, right? Right. So when we look at this, we know that uh, Green Valley, Cornwall Terrace, excuse me, Green Valley, Whitfield, and Spring Ridge 
are the three schools where we saw uh, developments being impacted as well as already current numbers um, that are quite high and exceeding the suggested 90% capacity. The, the middle column there is what was projected from our demographers uh, for the year 2022. And there are, again, some different fluctuations. Some are higher than the projected number, some are lower. And then we also take into consideration um, that demography study where they see us in 2025, again, based on growth trajectory and trends, considering the new developments and so on that we've taken into consideration. So what we're proposing in this right-sizing solution is that we take those three schools where we know growth is going to happen and is continuing to happen and actually enroll a bit of a lower number in those three schools to allow for, in the next five years, the continuation of that growth up toward capacity. The other two schools, Cornwall Terrace and Shiloh Hills, can be enrolled with a little bit of a larger number because the growth projection is not quite the same as it is in the other three schools. So while it looks like, wait a minute, you were trying to right size and make everybody equal, we tried to balance the growth in accordance with what the actual enrollment is. So hopefully that makes sense in what we're thinking. Um, we want the average size to be about 562 students overall, um, but we're allowing for that fluctuation um, in enrollment based on growth using those numbers. So what would be the benefit of doing something like a right-sizing solution? Well, we're going to be reducing overall enrollment in the schools where we're exceeding capacity, and that's something that's important for us to do. Um, we can't continue to just um, be putting in portable classrooms and um, shorter term solutions that really are not all that functional in the day of a, an elementary age student. This is a longer term solution to reduce the capacity in those three schools as we talked about. We hope um, to do all in our power that we can do to create only one shift in a student's elementary career. So within that five to six year period, we don't want people having to shift multiple times. We want to do a right sizing once and then later on down the road, um, once the board has given us direction where we're going, we may have to do a full redistricting later on. Um, it will, as I said, if we do this right sizing, will allow for growth in the enrollment at each school based on our projections. And we see that as a positive um, because we have the space to uh, account for some of that growth. So we're not in the same boat this time next year. We think that class sizes will be able to remain at or, or near the recommended numbers that I had given to you earlier, um, plus or minus here or there. And in addition, um, as we work through this plan, we were talking with our CFO, um, Mrs. Schlossman, about what we could do financially to prepare down the road for the staffing of a new elementary school. This will give us a five-year projected plan as opposed to um, two years in plus an, a three-year plan, um, we will extend into probably opening a new school um, if we are directed to do so around 2027, which would give us an additional two years to accumulate that funding that our business office has been working toward accumulating for the proposed new elementary school when it comes to staffing. So those are some of the benefits that we were thinking. Um, and so with that comes our recommendation of what will happen um, in this second phase. So, so before we go on to the recommendation, I, I just want to uh, go back to those guiding principles because I think it's extremely important um, when we're talking about this right-sizing plan to understand um, the efficiency this, this creates. Um, we have first first-hand experience with a school that's uh, 620 and above right now. And it's been extremely diff difficult over the course of the past year and a half with students in that building to find space for things to occur. And uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not an ideal situation for um, educating students in a school that uh, doesn't have the capacity for that to occur. The second piece of that is when you go back to efficiency, uh, it's important to also understand that 
um, by doing it this way, although there is some cost associated with uh, engaging a consultant to analyze the data, it's a it's a it's minimal compared to um, to uh, equipping e each one of those schools with with additional classrooms, uh, portable classrooms. Um, we don't believe that a portable solution and a short-term solution is the right solution. So this is why we're we're talking about right-sizing our schools to balance them out so that the educational experience that students are are receiving is is pretty much the same in each one of those environments. Uh, it's not overcrowded. Um, um, the facilities that were built, like the cafeteria and the gym space, are adequate for the numbers that we're, we're looking to, to right size. And then finally, from the standpoint of physical responsibility, um, we're trying to, to create a, a structure that uh, gives us the opportunity to continue to look at the data to make sure before we make that final decision or recommendation to the board um, out to 2027, that, um, that it's absolutely necessary. So I will talk about um, the recommendations with phase two. So if you haven't heard, um, uh, we have recommended to the board that we build a new elementary school which will create six schools uh, in our, six elementary schools in our school district. Um, we are currently um, doing our due diligence on a site located on State Hill Road, um, as well as additional sites in the event that that site um, doesn't come to fruition. And then as Dr. Trickett uh, indicated, we plan to fully renovate and build on to Southern Middle School to make that school uh, um, much uh, more conducive um, to a middle school um, educational environment, wider hallway spaces, uh, in, improved laboratory, uh, science labs, et cetera. Um, and that, uh, that process, uh, the board is um, authorized uh, for conceptual design, which basically means we can start um, working with the architects to, to plan that um, moving forward. Um, if, if we could go back to the slide where the map is, um, I'd like to just kind of point out um, where the site is located um, in reference to the map. Um, Dr. Trickett, do you want to kind of maybe uh, give a direction of exactly where that is? And I think it's important to, to understand why we're looking so, so hard at this uh, location on State Hill Road um, because um, it, it's important to us as well that we minimize the, the time that students are on buses um, because um, um, it's, not, it's not a good idea to be on a, a bus for an extended period of time, although in a few situations you can see out in the perimeters of our, our district that might have to occur in some situations. But Dr. Trickett, please. Uh, sure. Um, just for the community's awareness, we, we are looking at um, a variety of sites, trying to exhaust all options throughout the, the district. Um, both that are close to the density of our population, which you can see kind of starts in the, the heartbeat there um, around the, the West Lawn uh, corridor. Um, the site that we're looking at right now that we're really going through the due diligence period on is highlighted with the white cursor. Um, it's adjacent to uh, Kakusin Meadows Park. If you're heading up State Hill Road, uh, it would be literally the, the next property next, uh, right after the parking lot. Um, it is in the Lower Heidelberg Township. It is in a site that we feel is, is within appropriate driving distance to some of the construction sites that we're seeing. So that, that is the site and we're working through um, the process of considering if that land is viable for the school district. Thank you, Dr. Trickett. Then I'll continue with uh, the benefits of, of uh, our recommendation on phase two of our, our projects. Um, as Dr. Trickett has uh, stated, it allows for future growth in the district at each of our schools. Um, it balances our schools, as I've mentioned, um, and produces a similar environment in terms of educating our students. 
it's it's forward thinking and futuristic thinking, um, understanding the data that we currently know and have that uh, relocating some of our students to some of those schools that won't experience growth over the next five years is the right thing to do. Um, and it, it also enables the district um, to create an equitable middle school experience for all of our students. So regardless if you go to Southern Middle School or, or West Middle School, um, they will be extremely similar in all aspects. And then finally, um, so what are the next steps um, before we get to the point where you guys can engage us with questions? What are the next steps that um, we are looking to tackle. Um, so <clears throat> we've engaged with a, a consultant to develop uh, three different scenarios uh, regarding right sizing. So we currently are working with a company called TransFinder to, uh, who are experts in, uh, in uh, this type of, of situation. Although over the course of the last two years, our entire team has become much more proficient in looking at some of these uh, types of data sets as to Dr. Trickett uh, and, and Dr. Stout have mentioned, we're able to, to really um, focus down into all different aspects of, of family situations, environment, um, when we make our, our recommendations. So um, we're going to review those recommendations from the consultant uh, with our school board um, sometime in March, which is started starting tomorrow. So it's, uh, it's a very short timeline. Um, uh, continuing on in, into March, we are going to continue to engage our community with different types of, of uh, opportunities for them to provide input. One of the tools that we currently use um, is uh, thought exchange. That may not be the only tool we use, but it's one we're considering at this point in time because it does give us uh, some, some, uh, some robust information. In, uh, April and, uh, in April, we will have the staff and community. Uh, we'll send out communications re regarding the, the updates on the right sizing of our district. Um, and then our, our goal is um, in May, because people do want to know what the changes are going to be for their individual families, we would notify uh, placements for the 22-23 school year uh, based on our interaction with our, our board and the three different scenarios that we've, um, we've presented to them. Obviously, we will pick a recommendation uh, of one of those three scenarios that we feel best uh, meets our guiding principles. And then uh, as we start to transition into uh, the summer, uh, we would hold building level events for students that are impacted um, so that we could um, make sure that, uh, that the, the switch to a different school is as comfortable and as uh, seamless as possible. Um, get, getting them engaged into that a new environment, uh, assimilated with uh, some of the students that will be attending there, et cetera. So at, at this point in time, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mrs. Troutman, and she's going to talk about um, how we're going to engage in conversation. Yeah, well, we're going to, we're actually, we, we're not going to have you come to the microphone. I, I'll bring the microphone to you, but if you do have a question, if you want to just write it on that question card that we gave you, what I'd love to do is create an FAQ um, so that we can share that with the whole community. So if you do have a question that you would like to ask now, I can just bring the microphone to you. We're going to ask you to speak into the microphone because we are um, live streaming this, and the only way to be able to hear you in this room is for you to speak into the microphone. So is there anybody who would like to ask a question? Thank you. Um, my 10th grade son was involved in redistricting right after kindergarten. He moved from Spring Ridge to Whitfield. And at that time, incoming fifth graders were given the opportunity to remain in their buildings as long as parents were able to provide transportation for them. And I'm wondering if you would be considering that again. Thanks. Well, thanks for asking that question. Actually, it has come up, and it is something that we uh, had anticipated as a community question and absolutely are considering at this point is how we make that happen. Yes. 
we've we've also gone. To, um, we've had the internal conversation, uh, obviously, about sibling pairs and those types of things as well. Um, so that's um, my question. <laughs> yeah, um, we are anticipating all of those types of things, and and uh, obviously, to Dr. Stout's point, we're we're working to make that happen. And yeah, I think my hope is that you know, if you already have siblings at a school that's being downsized those siblings would be considered part of the class that stays and not the part that goes to a different school if it's a first child, you know. Yeah, and, and that's something that we are considering is the siblings, uh, you, you know, situation and, and we will be looking at that as part of our uh, scenarios as well as we're doing our very best to not necessarily rearrange a lot of middle school placement to what Dr. Trickett's point was earlier. You know, we, we want to keep the best we can our feeder schools as feeder schools as they were. Um, so that is something, you know, again, is going to be pretty tricky, uh, but that's why we're engaging the consultants to really help us work through all of those considerations. Well, one of the current um, challenges that we have in, in our current model is that we have one school, and, and I think it's, it's no uh, secret that uh, students from Spring Ridge go to two different middle schools. So we are, we are going to make, um, we're going to create a solution for that moving forward so that we don't separate um, uh, students into two, two different middle schools from, two from the same school. So that has also uh, been part of the conversation. And the reason why, the reason why we're, we're coming forward to the board with three different uh, scenarios is because the complexities that go into moving students from one school uh, to another school are, are quite, uh, quite difficult. So we want to make sure that um, we have the opportunity to share um, all those different complexities and, and, and decide on the best approach for, for our Wilson community because our Wilson community might, uh, going back to those guiding principles, um, they might have different values um, than, than, say, a community that's not here in, in uh, this general area. So we want to make sure we try to to be extremely transparent with, with everyone involved that here's why we're doing what we're doing and here's how we arrived at, at the decision and the recommendation. Did you have a question? Okay, I'm not a parent. I don't have a child in the district, um, but I'm a concerned resident about open pocketbook of money that's pouring out. I'm a disabled veteran. I live on a fixed income. I would love for my husband to be able to retire. We can't. We're strapped because we're barely making ends meet, taking half my disability check and putting it in the bank every month for you guys. So with all these new developments and this redistricting, which I think is a great idea, why would we need another school? Because according to the Heritage Foundation, our enrollment is going down. So my concern is with all these new developments, that's more tax money for you guys. Why can't you cut us a break and let us be involved and stop the spending? Well, certainly um, part of our approach has, to, has been to try to eliminate uh, spending. And, and an example of that is um, the, the reason why we're here in front of you is right-sizing our schools buys us time to not have to, to expend resources on portable classrooms. So I'll give you, um, uh, it costs about $250,000 to bring in uh, a four-classroom unit. And those dollars are taxpayer money. So our solution has been to, to not do that. To, to utilize existing space that we have within our school system at our elementary level to try to balance our schools, to buy us more time. Now, the, you know, I, I can't speak to what the Heritage Foundation is saying, but um, all I can go on is um, the, the studies that we've had developed and, and the reality that we're seeing. Um, the reality of what we're seeing is, is growth. And, and that is uh, no better example of that is um, currently, uh, is, is there is no better example than our current Whitfield. Um, that school has 
increased exponentially um, over the course of the last several years to the point of we did bring in portable classrooms to try to mitigate some of those issues because there was no place to place kids. Um, now, with growth um, comes comes uh, some responsibility, um, and and we're doing our absolute best to have the conversations with our finance committee, with our our, our school board, um, to to prepare for um, this growth over time before it becomes an issue where we're we're impacting the delivery of instructional programs. Uh, for our kids. Um, I, I do understand, I live in the district and, and uh, I don't like tax increases either, but, but um, there, there comes a time where we, we, um, we have to have conversations about um, the future of uh, Wilson School District and making sure that the future that, that we uh, chart for our school system meets the expectations of the community and we feel that um, based on the approaches that we've recommended so far we we do believe that uh, based on the information that we have that we are making the right recommendations for the future of wilson because we want to continue to be uh, the district of des destination and we want to continue to provide these um, opportunities for our students Hi. Um, so I know that the current recommendations is uh, to have uh, to build another elementary school, um, and uh, my question is also, I guess, two part. Um, one: uh, When do you think that the Southern Middle School would have renovations? Because um, you said that that does need work. Um, I have, I have uh, two children currently in Cornwall Terrace, and a third one most likely coming uh, in kindergarten next year, um, and so. Um, I'm just looking towards the future as well. And then, so one, when would it be the, uh, the recommendations for those renovations? And two, have you thought about building a, um, a new middle school instead of another elementary school? Um, because we know that the renovations need work. Um, is, that, is, is that a possibility or is that something that you thought about? I'll take the first part, uh, or the second part of your question. We've, we've had a, uh, approximately a two-year process where we've had multiple recommendations, uh, or let me say it this way, we've had multiple scenarios that we brought forward for conversation with our board. One of the, one of the, the things about a, um, a brand new um, middle school that uh, uh, people sometimes don't realize is it is uh, quite a bit more expensive to build a middle school because of all of the features that you have to add to the middle school, outside play fields, um, you know, football stadium, those types of things, um, than it is to build an elementary school. It also requires more um, land um, because there is a, a need for more space when you have uh, middle middle level schools. So yes, the answer to your question is, we've uh, we've gone down the road of 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 shall we build a new uh, middle school we've we've talked about different uh, configurations of our school system but ultimately um, when it came down to the final recommendation coming from um, from me uh, and my team was a couple of very important things number one we felt that the uh, having southern middle school in its current location was uh, more beneficial because that is the neighborhood school. Um, and uh, if you don't realize, uh, it's very difficult to find space on, um, any space on that side of the, of the 422. So we felt that it was important to have a school that was part of that, of that community. Um, and um, that would be as equitable as West, so it would look similar in, in, in scope to what the amenities are at West to make it, it, it doesn't matter which school you go to, you receive the same experience and the same types of quality. So um, 
Yes. So to answer your question, we looked at a lot of different things. I think we were at one point up to like 12 different scenarios, and and we started to uh, um, to uh, to really fine tune going back to those guiding principles uh, to keep us grounded in in what our recommendations were going to be. But uh, yes, it's been a it's been a complex uh, two years, uh, pandemic. Uh, excluded and uh, so we're very very confident with where we're at so do you want to speak a little bit to this first part of the question the first part was timeline correct so you saw earlier dr fadley presented the next steps um, on kind of what we're, we're calling this right sizing plan concurrent to that we're also working right now on this phase two idea and, and working as a team and with our board to bring back to the community kind of a, a, a more um, worked through proposal. And a lot of that is going to be dependent upon the market, you know, and, and what we're able to do within the budgetary confines that we have. Um, I will say that they kind of go hand in hand, you know, the, the building of the elementary school and the comprehensive renovation at Southern. There's, there's pieces that are connected in order for us to do that in a way to educate all of those 800 kids over at Southern Middle School. Um, so we don't have a clear timeline. Our goal would be that the elementary school would open in five years. Our goal would be that the comprehensive renovations would also be done within that five-year time frame. It could be done sooner than that or it could be done towards the, the tail end of that timeline. Part, part of the answer to that question, just to follow up um, with Dr. Trickett's comments, um, part of it is um, how we phase the, the project. So we're at the, as I alluded to earlier, we're just in the very beginnings of a conceptual design. So we want to make sure that when we phase the projects, uh, the middle school renovations and addition and the elementary school, that we do so in a cost-effective way so that we don't have a lot of time in between because every time, every month that goes by in a construction project, costs money, so we want to make sure we do it as efficiently, going back again to that guiding principle of efficiency. So we, we have yet to sit down and formulate the exact plan with our architects and our team because we're not at that particular point yet. But everything should be done um, in a perfect world, and the elementary school should open in 2027. I was just going to add that uh, Mrs. Troutman actually does maintain a website for the community. I'm sure she'll, she'll continue to push that out. And within that website, we have all of the information as it becomes available. So I would imagine within the next six months, we'll have some more of those details. Sorry, I have one more question. Um, I had heard some talk that, at least in regard to Whitfield, that there was a chance that we just wouldn't be enrolling a kindergarten class next year. Um, so I was curious your thoughts, are we not accepting kindergartners or are we going to be taking across all the grades, redistricting siblings and everybody or what your thought was about that discussion? Well, it's always very interesting to me how the many ideas that are circulated end up getting getting traction or not getting traction. And so one of the conversations was because we have five sections in most other grades at Whitfield, would we just downsize and go with four sections and then create another section in one of the schools that had a smaller enrollment number? At this particular time, we do not have plans to do that. We're taking full kindergarten enrollment as we would have planned. So. Um, the right sizing project that we're talking about would apply to the incoming students into kindergarten as well as their school age siblings. But thank you, that great question, appreciate that. Are there any other, whoa, are there any other questions? I think we're good. Do you have another question? Uh, just a quick comment, because we had, my, our family has gone through this before with uh, a kindergarten student that was moving into first grade, however long ago that was, 10 years ago. Um, it was obviously, you know, a very difficult issue for families. And I just, for the good of the community, I just wanted to share that um, 
the parents were obviously very upset that you were being you know, removed from our schools, a credit to our schools because we love them so much and we identify with them so much. Um, but when we moved from Spring Ridge to Whitfield, Whitfield um, had our kids come in over the summer. We were encouraged to bring our kids to the playground there to see it as a fun place to go and you know something that was more playful and positive for them. Um, they put all of the students that came from one school to Whitfield in the same classroom, so they started off with friends that they knew. And while the parents were upset for however many weeks or months over this, the kids took approximately four hours to get over it when they walked into that school building, saw friends, made new friends, and you know moved on very quickly. So it was just a comment because I know it's a very upsetting and emotional um, situation to be in if you are affected. But the children will be great. They were as resilient as they could possibly be, and they started a new journey in their new school, and it went wonderfully. So I just wanted to offer that comment for anybody who may be upset about the possibility. Well, thank you for saying that. And, and we do have, as part of already some brainstorming, uh, what we can do to uh, make that transition as seamless as possible. You had mentioned, and I have the, the fortune to have lived through two redistricting <laughs> opportunities here at Wilson, uh, one as a teacher and one as a principal. And um, you know, we will create those opportunities whereby students can get together and we'll create opportunities for families to let us know um, the, the students who might be transitioning with their child, that it could be a more comfortable situation, that they are placed in the same classrooms. We'll do tours, we'll have play dates, we'll make other kinds of arrangements. So um, any kinds of thoughts and ideas on feedback, we would be open to hearing um, because we do want that to be as smooth of a transition for kids as possible. But you're absolutely right that um, as grown-ups, you know, it was hard for us to get past that, and including myself as the principal of incoming students at the time. Um, but the students learned to love their new Wilson school as much as they loved the, the school that they just left. Yeah. Sorry, one last question. Um, as we have uh, more overloaded classes, um, it, what are we doing for um, uh, trying to um, uh, help uh, bring in more, more teachers and more staff for, for those who are um, uh, advanced readers, ad advanced students, as well as those who are struggling? And are there, are there anything that for the district that are to making more provocative to bring in more staff and, and keep the ones that we already have? Sure. Um, uh, thank you for, for asking a, a very informed question. We have been responsive in terms of adding staff where it has been needed, and our board has been supportive of making sure that we keep our class sizes at a reasonable and manageable number so that we can have those more personalized opportunities for those students who are, are more accelerated or, or advanced or those that need supports. What we don't want to do is create situations where we've heard those stories, you know, in other parts of the, of the world where, you know, there are 32 children in a class and, and you know, we, we can't create that personalized educational approach. So um, thank you to the board for supporting to this point um, that very effort that you're just discussing. And I, I would add just a couple of things to the, the point about the struggling readers. Um, um, we have... Uh, RTII in our school system, that um, which is response to inter instruction and intervention, and um, th they work as a, a team to identify the students that may need extra assistance, and we have specialized programs in our schools um, to work with students who are struggling readers. We have reading specialists, et cetera. Um, so we're constantly looking at the needs of each individual school and, and trying to do our best uh, in a uh, again, in a physically responsive, responsible way to meet those needs, um, also being mindful of, you know, we can't, we don't have a, an, an open checkbook to, to spend all the money that, that, uh, that we want to spend, but uh, we have to be mindful of our taxpayers as well. So we have structures in place to, to, to analyze that. And I have one more from someone that's watching online. What about using the money that's set aside for the new auditorium 
to be used instead for an elementary school? Why don't we put the phase one on hold? Because you're looking at a 38% tax increase with millage over the next five years. That's going to knock all of your seniors out of this district. And if you do that, where are you going to get your money from then? Because we're the ones with the burden of trying to hang on to our homes and, and, and stop this, this like Taj Mahal of a auditorium we don't really need, acoustics. I'd, I'd gladly come see my grandchildren or anyone's child graduate and we don't need acoustics and all this other fancy stuff. Can't we just do the cafeteria and build an elementary to satisfy what we need for our children versus um, a $45 million project for an auditorium that we really don't need? So, so part of the, the process that we, uh, we went, part of the process that we went uh, through to identify the future needs in the, in the school district was to engage in a comprehensive feasibility study which identified um, a number of deficiencies um, that were shared with the board. And then throughout that process, we engaged um, our community. I, I know that um, a community of stakeholders uh, brought various different opinions uh, regarding um, which order we should, we should start things. So we, we presented to our board, took guidance from them, um, with the consensus, the board uh, gave us direction on, on what items to proceed with uh, first and which ones to, um, to, to wait on. And, and part of the reason for um, the elementary school being in, in phase two of the project was alluded to earlier when we talked about um, the, being able to staff those schools. So staffing comes out of, uh, in a budget process, comes out of the general fund. Um, the, uh, the construction piece comes out of uh, typically in a school system. Um, there are others that do it differently, but comes out of uh, uh, going out for bond and, and borrowing money. Um, so through the con cons consultation with our uh, financial advisors and our CFO, um, we, we look to, to keep our debt service, which is that co uh, construction area that the, the debt that the district has at a constant so that we didn't exceed that um, throughout the course of the um, both phases of the project. So with an, in a combination of taking guidance from the board, looking at our borrowing ability and staying within the limits of our debt service, um, pushing the elementary school to the second part uh, a second phase of the project allows us the additional time to work several more years to build capacity within our current general fund budget um, to make that a reality. In, in addition, I think it's important that um, we, we understand that um, all of us, uh, that we work um, through our community um, and we work to, to meet the needs of that community. And one of the things that came up uh, when we were talking about uh, the, the high school project was um, safety. And, and part of that um, connection of the lower and upper house was uh, a direct result of, of the feedback we received. And I believe that those conversations have happened, I think, um, previously for maybe 15 or so years. Um, the auditorium and the performing arts uh, portion of the um, high school project is, uh, is, is reaching its end of life, uh, so to say, in terms of um, being modernized. Um, so that was another priority I know that has been discussed um, previously um, in the district and for many years. So um, when we set about to, to go through and prioritize what we were able to do, we did so in a way that we took uh, recommendations and, uh, uh, from the board and um, had conversations with the board and came to consensus on the order of things happening. And we've tried to do it in a way that uh, gives us an opportunity to maximize um, um, the time that exists, time as a resource uh, to create additional funding, but, but also to do it in a, uh, in a way that um, 
is mindful of not exceeding that debt service limit um, so that um, obviously if you have to borrow money, you want to do so in a, uh, in a, uh, a, a very sound way um, and you don't want to, to adjust uh, up the, the responsibility of the taxpayer. So keeping that within that limit uh, doesn't overburden the taxpayers because it is uh, currently built into our budget. Um, I just had one question about neighborhoods. Are you planning to take, pick and choose what families based on other things would go to different elementary schools or will it be by neighborhood? And I had one other question. Whitfield and Green Valley are two of the schools that are overcrowded, I believe. They both go to West, but you were gonna try to keep people in the same feeder schools. How would that be possible? Because I assume they would go to Cornwall Terrace or Shiloh Hills, but then go to West with kids they hadn't gone to school with. So, so um, as I um, stated earlier, we're we're working with the consultant, um, Transfinder, to um, to mitigate the impact to our our community. So, um, what I mean by that is that's why. <clears throat> We gave, we gave them parameters of how to conduct their um, right-sizing research so that they, they tried to meet the, those uh, particular parameters. One of those parameters was, not, was to not um, um, split up you know, the feeder patterns uh, of the school district. So we're working, um, we're working to make sure that that doesn't happen and um, in terms of your question about uh, are, we, are we picking neighborhoods and what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at a holistic solution that um, based on their recommendations would number one, um, work with transportation to not increase costs there. It would work with um, um, you know, the, the ride time with transportation and it all it would also um, take into account the um, the who goes where currently and um, how many students that impacts versus the different pr proposal uh, I think are all things that that uh, we're keeping at, at the forefront of our mindset um, when we work with with the uh, company to to come up with the final recommendation so it's a little bit early in the process to know exactly what the recommendation is going to be from TransFinder, but I can tell you um, all three of us up here at this table and others that aren't sitting here have, have tried to strategize because we're all parents. I mean, we all have uh, children that went to, we all have children that go to school with the exception. Um, Stacy's a little bit older than the rest of us. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. <laughs> Although no, my I'm, kids I'm did go kidding. through Wilson, just so you know. So uh, that, was, that was just a little bit of humor, but um, um, I have a four-year-old that uh, will be a kindergartner at some point, and I have a 10-year-old, and I currently have a senior, so all of these types of things could impact my family as well, and I'm trying to think um, not only as a superintendent, but also as a parent as to, okay, if I were a parent, how would I react to this if I didn't work with the school system? So we're, we're all doing that. And, um, you know, I, I do understand that in what we do, we can't make everybody happy, but we're certainly trying our best to, to keep it as, as minimal as possible um, with, our, with our plan. I would love to see a beautiful, you just need to speak a, little okay, a beautiful, wonderful new Taj Mahal that we've, we've got. I, I'm only a few blocks away, so I would love to see it, but we got to look at our economy, too. We're a 40-year high of inflation. I don't know about you, but I just filled up my gas pump, and I paid three seventy-nine a gallon a year ago or a little over a year ago. We were at less than, you know. We gotta, you have to sooner or later understand that there are wants and there are needs. The needs are we need space for children. We need classroom sizes. We need upgrades for the children. I understand that. 
wants is this Taj Mahal of an auditorium that we don't need. Three, four, five hundred thousand, upgrade it, you know, upgrade it and just get it like tang on for another maybe five, ten years so that we can do our needs right now, which is taking care of our children uh, and, and educating our children the best way that we can. And then down the road, let's look at what your little want is. Um, I'm, just, I'm just pleading with you, not now. 40-year high inflation, that's a long time, that's a lot of money, and we're not even through the inflation. We don't know where it's going at this point. It's ridiculous, this administration that we have. So I'm just begging you from um, a, a person who's lived here for, since 1986, please have some, some compassion and thought to the seniors out there that will be losing their homes over this, and there's 12,000 a year across the state that do every single year because of property taxes. That's all I'm asking. Is it, uh, oh, Mike. My boss has a question. Uh, no, it's not so much a question. It's just that uh, I want people to understand clearly it's not the phase one project that's generating the increase in taxes. That project will have, a, a, will have an impact on taxes, but it's the the phase in of a potential new elementary school is driving the tax bill. So I just want to make sure that separate the two so everybody understands that the cost of construction isn't really what generates a tax increase. It's a lot of dollars, but an overall scale of taxation is the, is the employment of new teachers. It's, that's what increases the, the taxes because when you have 72% of your budget for salaries and um, fringe benefits, that's, that's what you're seeing. So um, and once again, the, the, the bids have not come in yet on the, they will be coming in shortly on the phase one. So there's a lot of discussion to be continued. So um, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Um, I'll stick around. We'll stick around for a few minutes if you were uh, one of the shy people that don't like to ask questions uh, in public. We'll certainly uh, we'll certainly be here for you, but um, I, I would encourage you to stay connected with the website. Um, Mrs. Troutman does a phenomenal job of communicating um, what's going on in our school district on a regular basis, weekly, um, and uh, keeps a fabulous website of information. Um, come to our board meetings. Um, and uh, we have call. Uh, we have public comment periods. Uh, it's not a question and answer type of thing, but at least um, you can have an audience with the board to to share your thoughts and concerns, uh, questions, and uh, certainly we will follow up with you uh, uh, after that meeting and uh, try to address uh, all of your concerns. But um, it's a it's a wonderful community to be a, a leader in, uh, a parent in. And I look forward to uh, doing our absolute best for all of our stakeholders, um, the best we can for everyone uh, to make the Wilson School District continue to excel. Thank you again.